Our call to worship is from Psalm 71. Let us join in that call to worship responsively. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Our hymn of praise is Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, hymn 478. May we stand as we sing together. If we claim to be sinless, we are self-deceived and the truth is not in us. But scripture gives us this affirmation and assurance. If we confess our sins, God through Jesus Christ is just and may be trusted to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from every kind of wrong. Let us admit our sins before God as we pray together our prayer of confession printed in the worship bulletin, which will be followed by a moment of silent confession. Let us pray together. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, your face is hidden from us by our sins, and we forget your mercy and the blindness of our hearts. Cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires. With lowliness and meekness, may we draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength. Through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. If a person is in Christ, he or she is a new person altogether through confession and forgiveness, for the past is finished 
and gone, and behold, everything becomes fresh and new each day because through the power of God's love through forgiveness, we are indeed given, indeed, a new chance in our failures to rise above them and to serve Christ as forgiven sinners. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, I invite forward uh, Dr. Nat Sparrow, who is the elder sponsor for Mr. Frank Crawley, who will be received this Sunday as an affiliate member. And I'd like for KC to step out wherever she is. Is she here? Yes. Uh, this is the other part of the couple here. This is uh, KC, who was received as a member of First Christian Church. And this is Frank, whom she married. Frank is a graduate student at North Carolina State University. He grew up in the Episcopal Church and has received that nurture. And we're thankful for all those influences in his life which have brought him to this place. An affiliate member is a member of, uh, for two years and that can be reaffirmed. It is a procedure used mainly by students or those in the military or those who are in business and are located in, the, in an area for a short period of time. So we welcome you, Frank. You have been received here as an affiliate member because of your faith in Jesus Christ and another branch of the body of Christ. And as we receive you as an affiliate member, we acknowledge that we are members of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And because of this, you did not come to us as a stranger, but as a brother in the Lord. And we welcome you to the worship and work of this people of God we know as First Presbyterian Church. The sense of unity is reflected in the epistle to the Ephesians, where in the fourth chapter we read, there is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. I address this question to you. Do you promise to be a faithful affiliate member in this body of Christ, giving of yourself in every way, and by so doing, fulfilling your calling as a disciple of Jesus Christ the Lord. We respond by saying, I do. I do. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we do thank you for your action in Frank's life that has brought him to this time and place. And we pray that his affiliation here at First Presbyterian Church will be a time of growth and blessing in his life as he gives up his time and talents and as he becomes a member of this body of Christ. Bless him and use him. In your name we pray. Amen. Sheila is presenting to uh, Frank a certificate acknowledging that he has been received as an affiliate member. And at the close of the service, you are encouraged to come forward. That will be after the brief congregational meeting. Uh, so please come forward, introduce yourselves to Dr. Nat Sparrow, who in turn will introduce you to Frank Crawley, an affiliate member. Again, Frank, welcome. Thank you, Nat, for assisting this morning. Good morning and welcome once again to worship. If you're a visitor here with us, we'd like to call your attention to the visitor's cards which are on the pew racks. Take one of those and the red ribbon and be sure to pin it on you so that those sitting near you and walking out with you today will be able to recognize you as a visitor and greet you. If you're a visitor and you'd like to learn more about membership here at First Presbyterian, there will be an elder in the session room immediately following the service. The session room is to the right of the pulpit. Should you wish to make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, transfer your letter of membership, or by reaffirmation of faith, that elder will be able to describe to you the process and what it means to be a member here at First Presbyterian. Also, the pastors will be at the doors and then after that in Balkan Parlor following the service and we will be there to um, talk with anyone that would like to talk with us. And any, everyone, members and visitors alike, are invited to come to the parlor for a time of fellowship and coffee following the service. Everyone is asked to sign the Friendship Register, which is located on the center aisle of the pews. If you'll fill that out with information about you, telephone number and address if you're visiting here, then we will have a way to get up with you this week and talk with you more about um, First Presbyterian Church. 
Um, also following the service, there will be a Stephen minister in the session room, which is next to the pulpit. A Stephen minister is a lay uh, member of the congregation who has gone through a special training, a series of weeks of special training, and gained skills in working one-on-one -on -one with members of our congregation or others with special needs. If you are interested in learning, learning more about Stephen ministry or would like to talk with someone about maybe getting a Stephen minister for yourself or someone that you know or becoming a Stephen minister, that person can tell you more about that. Um, once again, good morning and welcome to worship. that way you guys have got more room we have stairs here okay come on in there's somebody there that needs to be let in let her in she won't bite and they won't bite you one more okay throughout our lives um, we will be in many circles of people you may already be in school have your little circle of friends that you spend all your time with and sometimes, as human beings, we forget and we exclude some people from our circles because they may not be cool enough or people are excluded for many reasons, the color of their skin or how tall or short they are or if they have disabilities or uh, because they're richer or poorer. Um, and today I want to draw your attention and remind you that in this circle, this is representative of God's circle, and we always want to include everyone in our circle despite anything. That's why I kept saying, she won't bite, let her in. Okay, and right now I'm gonna ask you, we're gonna try something and see if this works. Reach out, we're gonna make our circle tighter. So reach across and take the next person's hand with, like this. Like you hold her hand, his hand, and I'm gonna hold inside the circle. Can we do this? This might be too difficult. Oh, over top, over that arm. I don't think this is going to work, but it's fun anyway. And now we have more members, and we have to let them in because we just said we're representative of God's circle. Okay. If this would work, um, this, by doing this, we have made our circle tighter. And I'm afraid we don't have the right hands in the right places because if we've done this right, we should be able to raise our hands and put them behind the back and everyone be inside the circle because even we were outside the circle. <laughs> Okay, let's have a quick, quick word of prayer before you go off to God, let us pray. Um, we thank you for these wonderful little faces, and we ask that you bless them and nourish them as they go off to Children's Church in a little while. And we ask that you remember that we always include everyone in our circle as God includes everyone in his circle. In your name we pray. Amen. Our hymn is number 335, Though I May Speak. Please stand.
Let us pray. Holy God, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that we may hear and understand your word to us this day. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Our Old Testament lesson for today comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Jeremiah's, Jeremiah's call and commission. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet of the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The Lord bless the reading and understanding of God's word. Our New Testament lesson is from 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 13. Hear now God's word directed to us. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be wondering where Bob Inskeep is. He is on study leave. He will surface this evening uh, for the men of the church and then go back into hibernation and uh, will be gone again next Sunday. We'll, we'll be back in the office next week. I told folks it, it's good to, uh, to wake up on a Sunday morning like this and not to see all the snow we had at this time last year. Uh, makes life a lot more bearable. I like a snow, but in small amounts. And
and uh, last week was in Richmond, Virginia for our alumni meeting, and uh, we had folks who couldn't even get from the hotel to the seminary because they were stranded in the hotels because of the heavy snow. So what a difference a year makes. Our gospel lesson is the lectionary passage for this Sunday from the Gospel of Luke, which continues what was read last Sunday and preached on by Bob Inskeep about the Jubilee. So I began at verse 17, reading through verse 30 of the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the, a release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath and Sidon. There are also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Assyrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they may hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, on this beautiful Lord's Day, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. From a human standpoint, we would say how tragic it is. Hometown boy comes home. He's achieved acclaim. They like at first what he says. He reads the words of Isaiah, the Jubilee. But then he begins to meddle. Then he gets them upset. But Jesus knows what they are thinking. They think that the words he read from Isaiah 61 were meant just for them and for no one else. This is why Jesus says, you know the proverb, doctor, cure yourself. He says, I know what you're thinking, that why can't you do what you did here like you did in Capernaum? And then he says, a prophet is not without honor, is without honor in his hometown. He knows that they have interpreted the words just read only for themselves and they do not really believe that these words of God through the prophet Isaiah spoken by him apply to anyone else. God's circle of love is limited. What Jesus is about as Messiah is that God's circle of love is not limited. Do we believe Jesus? So our topic. And the focus is this. What Jesus is getting at is any faith tradition which becomes blind and restrictive about God's love and the gospel of salvation blocks the universal nature of God's love. Any faith tradition which becomes blind and restrictive about God's love in concrete issues of life that God's love of salvation is open to all and not restricted, blocks the gospel, blocks God's love, and must confront God 
and you confront God through individuals who are disciples of that word of liberation. Jeremiah was encouraged that do not be afraid. It may be controversial for you, but do not be afraid. He was given the encouragement that God is with him. Jesus knows the Hebrew scriptures. And Jesus speaks the truth in love. Blind tradition takes a tradition which is positive and turns it into something which is negative. And why is that? It's because here of prejudice. Deadly it is, prejudice. Destructive it is. Why? Because it is motivated by the power of sin. Me, me, me. If we have this relationship with God, God's circle of love includes me and no one else. And that's the power of sin. And this is why they got so angry with Jesus, the hometown boy who made good. He had done all these wonderful things. They want to see it done in Capernaum. But then he begins to meddle. He gives them two examples of how God's love, affirmation of others, went beyond the people of the covenant of Jews. He gives them two examples, which we know of as examples from kings, 1 Kings and 2 Kings. He mentions first Elisha. Elisha had just won a tremendous spiritual battle with the prophets of Baal, but then he gets a little bit scared, and then he becomes uh, hounded by Jezebel, and he flees, and he, and he does not stay to minister in the time of drought to those who might need bread. He goes to Sidon. And the widow of Zarephath and her son are ministered to by God through Elijah. She's gathering sticks for her last little fire, and she has enough in the, in, in the cruise to make one last meal. God's love reaches out to include the non-Jew outside of the bounds of the Hebrews. That's 1 Kings. Then he dips into 2 Kings, chapter 5. During the time of the prophet Elisha, there were plenty of lepers in Israel. But the power of God did not move to cleanse the lepers in Israel. The power of God moved to cleanse a leper from somewhere else, Naaman. Naaman, a powerful commander. The love of God reaches out and includes those not in the supposed narrow circle. God's circle of love has no limits. And with that, they are so angry. In a moment, like turning on a light switch or turning it off, admiration turns to spite and to anger, and they want to harm Jesus. You would think that the people of Nazareth, of all places, would have a much more tolerant view of others because of where they were located. I don't know how many years ago uh, it was now, but in the North Carolina Museum, there on Ridge was a wonderful uh, exhibit, an exhibit of the city which disappeared, Sepphoris. I have a book given to me by a member of the church. Sepphoris for centuries disappeared. We knew about Sepphoris. It's sort of like the, the lost city of Atlantis, you know, they talk about it. Where was it? Where was it? Well, Sepphoris was talked about by scholars in the New Testament, by, by Jewish scholars. Sepphoris was only located about 10 miles from Nazareth. Nazareth was a small community. Sepphoris was a metropolis, Greek, Roman, and Jewish culture. Rabbinic scholars were there. They wrote many of the writings of the Talmud. After the rise of Christianity, the rabbinic scholars there spoke about this sect of the Nazarene. So close through the environs of, uh, of Nazareth, on the way to Sepphoris, past merchants and soldiers and travelers from all over the known world. Those folks were exposed to people from all over. And scholars have wondered in reading the Gospels in terms of how was it that this Jesus from, from, from this small town of Nazareth had all this knowledge about things? Well, he was son of God, all right, but he was son of man. He was a human being, and he had to learn like everybody else learned. And Jesus was able to make the connection in terms of the love of God, which was to be revealed through him as Messiah for all people. Yes. And it's ironic, too, 
that from the hill of Nazareth, one can see the vast panorama of the history of the Jewish nation, a lot of it. The slopes go down from, from, from Nazareth. And you can see the plain of Estralian, where Judge Deborah and Barak had fought the enemies of God, where Gideon won his victory, where Saul came to a disaster, where Josiah had been killed in battle. And in the distance, one can see Mount Carmel, where the prophet Elijah had fought the spiritual battle with the prophets of the pagan god Baal, sponsored by Queen Jezebel. All that was there for them to see the faithfulness of God to them in good times and bad times. For the folks gathered in that synagogue that day, God's love was limited. The circle of God's love included them and not others. And that was foreign to the mission of Jesus as Messiah. When he reads the words of Isaiah 61, the jubilee, sight to the blind, good news to the poor, release to the captives, release to those who are oppressed, he's talking about a dimension of salvation history spiritual health, which is not only eternal life, but a quality of life to be affirmed in the issues of life the here and the now. You cannot talk about salvation in the future without claiming the worth of individuals in the here and the now who are loved by God. God's love, the circle of God's love is not limited. Do we believe Jesus? We can sit here smug in the sanctuary and say, well, those, those folks should have known better. <laughs> they should have known better. But they were dealing with controversial issues. They'd been carried off to captivity. They'd been brought back, and they had kept their Jewishness by confirming what was unique about them. But that strength became their Achilles heel. And that can become our Achilles heel as well. For the Presbyterian Reformed tradition, as, as other denominations, have claimed the fact that God's circle of love knows no limits if we are the followers of Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen Lord. To claim the victory of the cross over sin and death is to claim that victory over sin and death in the issues of life which affirm the worth of human beings. It's interesting, in this country, Roger Williams did that with the Baptists in Rhode Island. So I came over here as a Puritan, had to leave there to go to Rhode Island to protect the rights of individuals who wanted to be descendants. And they also ministered to the Indians. Francis McKinney came from Ireland, minister, lawyer, founded some 70 churches on the eastern seaboard and felt like that the gospel needed to be preached in New York and he engaged in civil disobedience, went up there, was arrested, thrown in prison, and when I finally got out, Wooster, Presbyterian minister, worked with the Cherokee Indians in Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and went with them on their trail of tears, affirming the worth of these people, most of whom were Christian, and a percentage of them were Presbyterian. In Alabama, he stood up against federal troops who were abusing the Cherokees, and he was thrown in jail. The Supreme Court of the United States said, set him free, and the governor of Alabama said, if you want him free, you come down and free him yourself. And today there's a College of Worcester in Ohio in honor of this individual who witnessed to the fact that the circle of God's love knows no limits. But the time earlier than that even, that window back there, McPheeters, first pastor of this church. Early on in the 19th century, McPheeters came to the defense of a free black person who was well-educated, who wanted to preach and had, was, had the credentials to preach and stood up for him to have the legal right to both to teach and to preach. Chavis was his name, and we have a park here, not far from here, named for this black Presbyterian minister. Controversial it was, yes. In 1954, in Montreat, North Carolina, in the western part of the state, commissioners came from all over the Presbyterian Church U.S. Six months before the Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Education. And at that general assembly, there were representatives from all over the South. 
equally divided between elders and ministers of word and sacrament. And they took a controversial stand, and they knew they were going to have to have face the heat when they went back home. They voted to change the book of church order that said that anyone who claims Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior cannot be admitted, cannot be refused. Membership and worship in a church based upon race or color or class. And that was like a bombshell. Well, unfortunately, there were Presbyterians who claimed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but it felt like God's circle of love was for them. And as a result of the decision, within seven or eight years, a sizable group of Presbyterians left the denomination because they believed that that assembly was meddling in social affairs. They believed that the mark of Ham had been put on blacks, and they were inferior. When you start taking seriously what Jesus said in that synagogue, in every decade, it can be controversial to stand up for the circle of God's love which knows no limits, no bounds. The gospel of salvation, the words of jubilee, Indeed, what happens for us beyond the grave is what is to happen in the here and now as we affirm the worth of people. You heard what Dr. Edwards did here in 63. <laughs> when that was the boycott of, 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 of stores and particularly the, the theaters. Came to the pulpit, asked, did you do what I requested you to do the previous Sunday to pray and to write? And no one basically raised their hand and Al said, basically, if you can't, hear the word, you don't need to hear me, and he walked out. 60 seconds into the sermon. In 1968, Alan Edmondson, a graduate of Hampton Sydney College and Union Theological Seminary, was there when Martin Luther King was assassinated, and I was there and others. He had the courage to speak out on Sunday morning, right after that, about reconciliation. He received death threats that the man he lived in was going to be bombed, that his wife was going to be raped, that his children were going to be hurt, and he had to flee. And these were supposedly good people. The circle of God's love is for us. Not so. We could give example after example. Today, in North Carolina, there are 200 to 400,000 Hispanic migrants. They work all over the state, in western mountains, picking apples, harvesting trees, working in the Piedmont area. All the, the hand-harvested fruits or tobacco. They're here, many of them legally. There are some illegal, perhaps a sizable minority. But those folks depend upon the goodwill of those who employ them, plus the national and the state laws which protect them. And thank goodness many employees do honor that. Thank goodness. But you know, friends, there's a sizable majority who do not, who do not. The Department of Labor, the state of North Carolina, has a tremendous responsibility, almost mission impossible, eight field supervisors there to go out and to find out which migrant camps meet the minimum standards, and you know, 1,700 met the minimum standards. And if you meet, if you go above the minimum standards, you can get a gold star. And the labor representative admitted that perhaps there were maybe 1,700 illegal camps, small. Not enough time to regulate all this. The book is beautiful, written for, for folks to follow. One party john for every 20 workers out in the field. Last year, there were three complaints that were not party johns out there for women and men to use. But the Hispanics, you see, don't complain. Because if they complain, they may lose their job and the money they earn, their hard working has to be sent back down to Mexico. Like we read last week when a migrant worker here was killed behind a backhoe when a tree fell on his head. Had a wife and four children back in Mexico. Several of us visited two migrant camps. One had a gold star and one didn't have a gold star, and I couldn't tell a smidgen of difference between the two. <laughs> Talk with Hispanic workers. I wouldn't put my dog <laughs> in either one of them. This church has made a commitment through its mission committee to minister to this group of folks, 200 to 400,000. 
Yes, mainly they claim to be Roman Catholic, a sizable minority, though, all Protestant and Presbyterian from a certain province in Mexico. We made a commitment to try to do something, to organize perhaps a community of faith for them, to minister to them like we do with all others who come to 124. But it's going to take the work of this church volunteers to make it happen. We have a grant from Presbytery. We have money which is an escrow. These are individuals who are the new underclass, been around for a long time, who too need to hear the good news of the gospel, sight to the blind, release of captivity and from oppression. And when we talk to them about gospel salvation, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and resurrection and victory over sin and death, and there is salvation for you, when they hear that, they also need to hear that they have worth as children of God in the here and the now. And we have a wonderful opportunity. But do we believe Jesus? Do we believe Jesus? That the circle of God's love knows no limits. Or will our prejudice twist our tradition and make it restrictive? God forbid that that should not happen to us, that we will indeed believe the word of Jesus to us today. It was said that after these folks were so angry with Jesus, they hauled them out of the synagogue, they took them to the brow of the hill, which ironically you could look out and see the vast panorama of God's interaction with his people in good times and bad, and they wanted to throw Jesus off the cliff and hurt him because he had spoken the word of God to them as Messiah about God's love, knowing no limits of love. And what does the scripture say? It's this enigmatic saying. It ends by saying, he passed through their midst. Let it not be said of us that he passed through our midst because that is a phrase of indictment of those who should know that the gospel of Jesus Christ, a crucified and risen Lord, knows no limits. Indeed, let us hear the word of Jesus today from the gospel of Luke and the opportunities for us to demonstrate what we sang, what we have heard, what we claim, that God's circle of love knows no limits. Hallelujah. Amen. In response to the gospel proclaimed, let us stand and affirm what we believe, using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which are found on page 14 in the hymnal. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May be seated. Let us look to God in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Creator God, source of life and love, we lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving for the evidence of your presence in our world. 
for your caring for all things and all persons, for your love poured out to us through Jesus Christ. We come to praise you, great God, and in doing so, we acknowledge that all of life teaches us of your love, of your boundlessness, of your caring and compassion that knows no limits. We thank you, God, that in your kingdom there are no strangers or outcasts, for all are invited to feast at your table. We thank you for the privilege of sharing in the ministry of Christ, for the power of the indwelling spirit which enables us to forgive and to be forgiven. We pray for ourselves that our congregation be open, accepting, and inclusive of all people. We pray for the grace and humility, the compassion and courage of Christ. We pray for the breaking down of barriers and judgments as we realize we are all both healed and in need of healing. We pray for others, for those who have been made to feel outsiders, for those who have an elitist attitude and bearing, for blessings upon churches and social agencies where the poor are cared for, the abused are sheltered, recovering addicts are respected, and restorative justice is exercised. We pray for the sick, the grieving, the dying, and the lonely, that they might feel strengthened through your love and supported by the body of Christ. Help us, O oh God, to live your love in word and deed. Show us the way to make the changes in our attitudes and our behaviors, that we fulfill your will for our lives, for our community, and for our world. We make this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us rejoice now in what we have been given and what is ours to give as we receive our morning offering.
Let us pray. Great God, your caring knows no boundaries or limits. There is no one outside the circle of your love. As your goodness has touched and saved us, may these gifts be a message of love to others. Bless this offering of money and strengthen us as a church in our witness to the inclusive grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our hymn is number 420, God of Grace and God of Glory. see that the Wewins are coming back into the sanctuary for the benediction, which they have studied in Children's Church. I charge you as we go forth to indeed be bearers of the good news, that the circle of God's love knows no limits, that as we make profession of faith in a crucified and risen Lord, victory over sin and death, that we become practitioners of that faith in all the issues of life, affirming the worth of all of God's children. And now the grace of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit Rest and abide with each and every one of you, both now and forevermore. Amen. Congregation, be seated for what we trust will be a very short.